on this blessed Mother's Day, uh, we also will think about the message of Lord Buddha uh, because two days from now is his birthday which also gets called as uh, thrice blessed day uh, because that full moon day was uh, uh, his birthday also the day that he got enlightenment and the day that he bid final goodbye from this uh, from his physical body uh, and he uh, mentions the supreme knowledge as our real mother, the supreme wisdom uh, that breaks all our shackles and makes us free uh, as our uh, supreme mother. So, Pradnya Paramita, as he calls that, Pradnya Paramita, the supreme wisdom that gets addressed in some of the hymns as our true caring mother. So, uh, let us look at some of the uh, teachings of uh, Lord Buddha. Uh, let us begin uh, with the uh, salutations as we traditionally uh, chant the uh, threefold uh, mantra of taking refuge. Buddham Sharanam Gachami Dhammam saranam gachami Sangham saranam gachami I take refuge in Lord Buddha. I take refuge in his teachings embodied as Dhamma or religion of Buddha. And I take refuge in the tradition uh, he helped to, uh, or he started. So, uh, these are the way in which, the, or the three channels through which we get the message of Buddha, Buddha's life. And this, this life actually embodies all the teachings. So, we go to the teachings. And then the teachings are actually uh, put into practice through a long tradition of disciples uh, who become the role models uh, telling us, yes, you can also do it. Uh, there is the life of Buddha and then there are the teachings of Buddha. But are really there people who uh, were benefited and got illumined by those teachings? Yes, and that is the Sangha or the tradition uh, of disciples. So, through uh, all this we get uh, the essence of the teachings of Buddha. And uh, the... Hello, next one. Uh, is uh, what is called this... Uh, one of the uh, uh, compilations of Buddha's teachings uh, in Sanskrit, Srangama Sutra. Buddha's teachings uh, have been compiled in uh, the mostly the language Pali, the language uh, of the colloquial style which people used to speak in those days and Buddha conversed with uh, them with these teachings and uh, they were then compiled together and that is where uh, the, the Pali Canon comes into picture. They are just uh, uh, directly uh, these things. Uh, uh, as Buddha spoke, uh, they were uh, compiled in details. Uh, with every detail, there was no attempt uh, to compress it. The idea was uh, you uh, stay with those teachings more, uh, keep yourself absorbed in that for a longer time. So, uh, it was there was no attempt there to 
shorten them. Similarly, with these uh, Sanskrit texts also, like this Surangama Sutra is a very long text. Uh, quite uh, a few incidents happened here and a lot of discussion on the message of Buddha. Uh, the primary idea in many of these, as you can see, uh, we confuse uh, the permanent with the impermanent and impermanent with the permanent. And thus that confusion becomes the source of uh, all the troubles that we encounter, all the bondages that we get into. So, uh, in Buddha's teachings, as you can see, this idea of impermanence of all types of forms, all types of perceptions through the senses has been uh, emphasized uh, with uh, a lot of details and force uh, because it is here that we uh, fall, uh, you know, uh, pray to various temptations. Seeing something, uh, it invokes something in us and then uh, we go to it uh, feeling that, well, uh, we may uh, be able to get that which we were seeing. So, uh, it is uh, uh, important, therefore, that uh, we understand that uh, here is something that is impermanent, continuously changing, coming and going, should not be uh, given a permanent value. Uh, a, a perception that is temporary uh, should be seen as a temporary perception, should not get uh, caught in it thinking that it is uh, permanent. So, uh, many of you, the students of Buddha's teachings, uh, whoever has read his life knows uh, a cousin of Buddha who became his disciple was the youngest in the family and his name was Ananda. Uh, he became a very ardent disciple and an attendant to Buddha staying with him uh, till uh, all his death. And through uh, conversations between Ananda and Buddha, we get a lot of uh, teachings directly coming to us. So this Ananda, he uh, was uh, a very sincere aspirant uh, towards the path of liberation, towards practicing uh, the teachings of Buddha. And while he understood them, uh, he uh, tried to put them uh, sincerely into practice. But as it happens uh, with uh, these uh, sincere practitioners, uh, we all have uh, you know, our issues to deal with, you know, uh, problems come up. Uh, we are marching towards perfection, uh, not that we are perfect. So there are pitfalls. And these pitfalls, uh, they become, you know, actually you can look upon that as in two ways, as uh, a learning experience. You fall and you learn through that fall. So, Ananda uh, was uh, uh, with other uh, disciples of Buddha. Uh, he went out to beg food. Uh, beg alms from different people, people in the city. And as per the command of Buddha, uh, he uh, was uh, going to uh, every household uh, to get whatever he uh, wanted uh, as food and, and did not uh, uh, discriminate between 
the ca different caste of people uh, or whether that person is learned or not learned uh, he was uh, treating them all as equal and was uh, uh, taking the arms and he at that time a sense of pride entered and which is a big enemy in spiritual life uh, the pride that i am a very good follower of buddha mm, the all other disciples they discriminate between good food and bad food and all but i am just seeking whatever i am getting in arms and so uh, he thought that uh, he was f exactly following the message of buddha up to that it is all right but then uh, he was hit with the pride that uh, so uh, that is uh, uh, he thought he is the superior to others and he is really established in the teachings of buddha and then as it happened uh, uh, he was uh, uh, asking arms and then uh, there was a prostitute's house and uh, the prostitute had a beautiful daughter when she saw this uh, uh, ananda a young man uh, a beautiful looking young man she uh, besieged her mother that well uh, that we should spell our uh, temptation magic around him and try to get him uh, i am in uh, tremendous mad love with uh, this young man and uh, the mother although hesitant uh, initially Uh, agreed to the daughter's entreaties and thus uh, 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 this ananda uh, he because of his pride he got tempted there and then as he was there uh, embroiled in the sense enjoyments uh, buddha was uh, sitting uh, with uh, some disciples and a uh, discussion was going on uh, buddha saw that what is happening to ananda and he sent another disciple to that place and told him that uh, you chant uh, this uh, hymn of liberation and that will remove the magic spell uh that magic spell will be removed uh, if you remind him that uh, uh, what is the purpose of our life all this idea of impermanence and all let uh, you you speak loudly and uh, when he hears it that uh, magic spell will break and uh, he will come here and that is how it happened and then ananda uh, asks this question to buddha uh, that well lord uh, why does a person uh, get stuck like this uh, what happened to me and although he felt that i am your cousin uh, i am Uh, so much attached to you and still uh, i get tempted uh, why so uh, he felt as somewhat indignation also that uh, i have been practicing sincerely all these uh, buddha's disciplines and still how can i be uh, overtaken by this silly temptation and then buddha asked him the question okay uh, i do understand that uh, I, you are a very sincere seeker of truth and because uh, you uh, are my blood relation we uh, you are my youngest cousin and i love you on that account too uh, tell me 
what attracted you to come to me and to my teachings in the first place and ananda replies that when i saw you i saw that uh, special uh, lustrous power uh, emanating from you which uh, i saw uh, keeps your wisdom always afloat and all the temptations uh, of enjoyment uh, they can never come close to you and so uh, seeing your strength like this uh, i came to you in the hope that i also uh, can get it then buddha said okay so you saw me like this uh, what did you see how did you see did you think about it how did you see well ananda replies that i saw uh, with uh, my eyes and of course my mind my mind and eyes with that i saw you uh, like this and then buddha said oh i see you saw with mind and the eye so tell me this you know the mind and the eye uh, whether that mind is inside or outside inside means inside the body or outside the body tell me and naturally as a person would think uh, ananda thought and said that well since we do not see it by the eyes it must be inside mm-hmm. we sure also uh, think that mind is inside the eye is outside but the mind is inside so uh, the inside mind uses the outside eye and then uh, sees the outside then buddha asks it is inside okay so where inside exactly can you tell how does it get connected with eye uh, and thus it uh, since it is seeing through the eye uh, it should have some kind of a connection is it not uh, how does that mind get connected to eye do you th- try to think uh, that if it is inside there should be some sort of a connection is it not and then uh, do you know who then puts the mind uh, to see uh, through the eye how does that get connected because sometimes it is not connected to the eye so you do not see uh, sometimes you hear then it is connected to the ear so where exactly it is situated if it is inside the body and also if it is inside the body uh, he says that then we should be able to see the inside also by just reversing that is it not uh, like you are seeing outside the room mm, he shows the window you are seeing outside the uh, room by the window and if you turn your back to the window you see the inside of the room so Uh, there should be a way by which you will be able to see the inside uh, is it possible that we see the inside uh, be- because if the mind is inside then uh, it should be able to see the inside as well uh, he says no it is not uh, possible i don't see that the mind can see the inside of the body okay then come on if it cannot see the inside of the body then uh, it is not inside the body the mind cannot be inside the body you do not know where it is is it in the eye or it is not in the eye and then they after some deliberation it is fairly long conversation very interesting uh, then he says that well it seems that the mind is 
connected to I, it must be part of the I. Well, if it is part of the I, then do you think when you close the eyes, that also gets closed? Mm. No, no, Lord, it doesn't, uh, I don't know how. Then how does it form a contact with the uh, outside objects? Why does it see only the things outside? It must be forming some kind of a connection outside. Uh, is the mind in the outside, the objects that you see, is it there? Said, no, I don't think it is, it can be there. Uh, because uh, he first said that it seems that it is there. Uh, then he says, if uh, everything that you are seeing, the mind is there, then what makes you say that my mind, uh, it is not your mind, then it is this person's mind, that person's mind, that object's mind. It is with all these things. So, uh, what is special that you are trying to say by the word, my mind? Uh, well, uh, then Ananda tries to, you know, when we do not find any pro answer, we uh, try to see, okay, if this is not correct, then this may be correct. If this is not correct, then this might be correct. He says, it appears that the mind is then between the space of the object and the eye, somewhere in between. And then that also, after a little deliberation, it seems that that argument also falls flat, it doesn't work. So, Buddha then uh, brings this truth, look, uh, this uh, perceiver uh, through the mind is, there is nothing like that, it is just a, 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 a phantom. Uh, because you keep on seeing these things and you confuse them as permanent and real. And that is why uh, you uh, feel that these all these things must be real as they appear. But they are not so. Uh, they are not as such true. That is a nice word. In themselves, uh, in it, it doesn't have any substance as such. Uh, there is uh, no uh, permanent thing that you can uh, show about them and therefore uh, if you impress this upon your mind that there is nothing permanent even in uh, your perceptions about you that uh, what made you think that uh, uh, you are uh, a, a real, true follower of Lord Buddha and what made the pride enter in you? You considered something that was impermanent as permanent. Yes, certain things you might have done right, but you took them as uh, something permanent and that is why uh, uh, you uh, did not uh, discriminate, you did not see what is impermanent uh, uh, and as impermanent. You thought it to be permanent and thus uh, you deviated. Uh, remember that uh, when the mind understands uh, things as uh, impermanent, as impermanent, uh, then uh, you will not get tempted. Uh, the vision, the mind and the I associated with that, all these things are really uh, a big phantom created by uh, the uh, associations. Uh, so, and one falls prey to this uh, idea that yes, uh, because I see it, it must be real. Uh, but if we analyze seeing, uh, it could be uh, also said, it uh, must be unreal because I see it. Because the process of seeing involves all these uh, conflicting and temporary things. So instead of saying, I 
see it and therefore it is real uh, we can also actually we should be saying this that because i see it it cannot be real it is uh, wrong to ascribe uh, that sense of reality just because of the sense perceptions so uh, that is uh, uh, throughout you will see in the teachings of buddha this idea uh very apparent uh, very clear that whatever is uh, a product of contact between sense sense object uh, we imagine a mind uh, that that mind has uh, this created this and so uh, the, the it is uh, a phantom that we say that uh, my mind uh, that gets created there uh, like uh, you see a circle that is an example that is given in gaudapada's uh, philosophy also uh, his commentary on mandukya upanishad uh, and here also uh, that uh, you see a, a circle if you Uh, move a torch in circle then uh, actually there is no circle but then uh, a lighted circle gets created there we see it now is it real just because we see it it is not there there is no substance to it and yet we perceive it so we perceive things and as we see and uh, we associate i am seeing this and thus that becomes kind of real to me and as it becomes real to me i go for it and that is what is uh, the reason for temptations i get then caught in it that okay i see this and this that is real and thus i go for it and then they get caught into it so therefore a person uh, following this discipline uh, should be always uh, carefully uh, thinking that what is permanent and what is not permanent there is no permanent ego permanent soul uh, they it is all impermanent only that wisdom uh, which never changes which is not a product of sense contacts uh, it is not product of mind that alone is the truth so thus uh, ananda uh, gets this idea this wisdom uh, next uh, you see uh, another th- the important idea in the teachings of buddha is what is called uh, the middle path uh, middle path uh, is uh, what it means is not uh, going to enjoyment nor uh, practicing uh, that kind of asceticism or uh, hardships to the body uh, sometimes Uh, when somebody wants to do spiritual practice and then sees the uh, uh, attractions of the sense objects as uh, a big problem an obstacle and thus determines that okay i will reject all these and try to live uh, without any of those uh external things i will it then translates further that let me live with utmost poverty i will deny everything to the body all needs shall be denied and that becomes another big trap that this kind of rejection or denial and practicing various hardships is taken for spiritual practice it does not bring actually any illumination buddha himself went through all this 
uh, he describes of course there is some poetical exaggeration we can say that he practiced uh, fasting uh, that okay because the food we get tempted by food go for it eat so many things uh, now so let the reverse of it let me fast let me deny taking food i will not take food and so he, uh, he was asked by uh, his teacher at that time that come on get into that so he started doing it and as was his wont he did it with such intensity and sincerity that he saw that maximum uh, after practicing to the maximum extent he saw i practiced it to the extent that i became so emaciated that if i touch uh, my belly i would be touching my back and if i touch my back i would be touching my belly uh, it be i became so uh, emaciated but my knowledge did not proceed any further by that i was just starving myself there are so many people uh, who unfortunately die of starvation does it mean that they get enlightenment that is not a way to get enlightened but uh, this becomes a practice with many to reject to deny uh, the one extreme yes okay i go for enjoyments other extreme is well i go uh, to reject everything that is uh, uh, that gives comfort to body so practicing physical hardships becomes uh, the uh, the important or most important all important part of spiritual practice and buddha did not want that uh, so uh, he uh, at uh, one point uh, this is uh, a story of a, a physician jivaka uh, buddha was seeing that uh, uh, he would pick up uh, himself some rags and put on and some uh, uh, of his disciples some monks would just spend uh, because they didn't uh, not because just they didn't get any clothings they thought that it is an austerity not to put them on so would remain naked and uh, that is uh, uh, he found that many of them were becoming sick Uh, because when they needed clothings they could not they didn't put them on so uh, he told them that well you should put on clothes uh, when it is cold uh, put on warm clothes uh, that is uh, he ordered them that do not practice unnecessary austerities uh, take whatever is needed to uh keep your body fit body is an instrument and just as you keep your instrument fit so also keep this body fit so that with that body uh, you will be able to practice this teachings of buddha so uh he in fact then told those who were you no know, bare footed so going around here and there at the cracked feet and all apply ointments he told them to apply the ointments and also use footwear so once it so happened that uh, he was staying there in uh, with uh, that king bimbisara's uh, capital and his uh, uh, kings uh chief uh, doctor physician he was a very devoted uh, disciple of buddha uh, he uh, was given a gift by some other king uh, who got cured by his treatment so he sent him as gift the best clothing the best available clothing and when he got it he thought that well i must uh, 
give it to buddha this is uh, this clothing is worthy of uh, buddha uh, he other he just picks up rags and puts them on uh, but i should present this to him so he goes to buddha and says uh, well you must grant me a boon and buddha replies well tathagata does not grant boons unless he knows what they are mm-hmm. so uh, jivaka assures well this is uh, uh, nothing improper i am not asking for anything improper uh, what only thing that i am requesting is this beautiful cloth i got so uh, i want it Uh, that you should accept it from me uh, and put they put it on so buddha thought that uh, this is a good way of showing the disciples that uh, uh, neither the uh, running after the uh, pleasantries and nor this kind of uh, uh, rejecting the things is the way for spiritual enlightenment uh, things could be so called good looking or bad looking that doesn't mean that we become spiritual by accepting or rejecting them so uh, buddha decided to accept it and told his disciples that look uh, you should not neglect the health of your bodies uh it is very important that you uh, take these things uh in uh spiritual practice what swami vivekananda tells many times at least two or three times in the complete works he we find this analogy used by him very beautiful analogy that uh, what is this world whether you take it or whether you reject it uh it is all is like uh, the mosquito sitting on the horn of a bull it should not affect you just as uh, whether you are putting rags you should not feel hey look i am uh, 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 such an ascetic person uh, i am putting rags uh, that is no nothing to be proud about it nor one should feel uh, satisfied and happy that look i have got such nice clothes let me go out and show off so uh, that also is not the right thing uh, this whole world uh, is like uh, the mosquito whether they are that mosquito sits on the horn of the bull or flies away Uh, he tells this story uh, that a uh, mosquito was sitting on the horn of bull and then after a while that conscience of the mosquito started troubling it mm. that well uh, and it said to the bull oh sorry uh, dear bull uh, i didn't mean to really uh, torment you i am sorry if i have caused this. i was sitting there for pretty long time and uh, i am sorry that i caused you a lot of uh, uh, say hardship lot of trouble here i am going away now the it doesn't matter to the bull whether that mosquito sits or flies uh, even if the whole family of the mosquito comes and sits on the horn the bull is not going to get affected at all so uh, even if the riches of the whole world uh, the so called best things come to you uh, it doesn't matter and even if you uh, do not have any of those things that should not also matter uh, that should not also create any sense of ego that hey look i am such an ascetic i have rejected everything so uh swami vivekananda there gives a dictum which is also in the teachings of buddha that uh, uh, neither seek nor avoid uh, do not seek do not avoid so uh, 
Buddha tells that you should have this, uh, take good care of your body, uh, that is important as uh, it is the important instrument for spiritual practice. And then there is a similar incident that takes place uh, almost uh, in the same vicinity. Uh, there was a disciple of Buddha, a lady, uh, Vishakha, a lady of means. She had, uh, she was a rich lady and uh, she once invited Buddha to stay uh, with her. And Buddha accepted, Buddha stayed with her. And at that time, uh, there was a lot of rain. And uh, there were a lot of disciples of Buddha uh, who were also staying just uh, around nearby there. Uh, they wanted to preserve their clothings and uh, so uh, they, it should not get, they should not get wet. So they took out the, 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 the clothings, they remained without clothes and uh, p properly packed those clothes and kept so that they shouldn't get wet. And this lady Vishakha uh, said, well, uh, I am seeking uh, eight boons from the Lord. Will you be able to please grant me eight boons? Again, Buddha repeated the same thing that unless I know what they are, I won't say yes or no. And she said that, well, they are very proper ones. Uh, what are they? I want to make the eight, uh, they are of similar type. I want to be narrating all the eight, but the uh, idea in all these is uh, that the disciples of Buddha, they should have uh, proper clothing and proper food, proper medications. So she says that, well, uh, I want to make an offering to the whole Sangha, uh, that is the community of uh, uh, his disciples, uh, the renunciating disciples, that uh, I would give them rain clothes. Uh, every rainy season I will give them a rain clothing to each. and. Uh, uh, next thing I ask is that I would like to give them a good food, uh, sumptuous food uh, every day while they are around here. And also I want to make arrangements that if they fall sick, uh, I will send medications to them uh, and so forth, uh, they, she says about those eight things which are of similar type, like uh, I would give them uh, the rice and milk cooked uh, on some days and so forth. So, uh, and he says, Buddha says, well, okay, but what caused you ask this boon today at this point? And she said, uh, when I sent my maid servants uh, to the where these disciples were staying uh, to invite them uh, to partake the food. Uh, she came and reported that, well, they were all sitting naked. Uh, and so uh, that uh, I thought is not the right thing. Uh, and why when uh, she asked the reason that they were afraid that and the clothes will get wet in the rain and they will get bad. And they will be uh, uh, become useless. So to protect the clothes, so this is a, a reverse thing, you know, that it is, uh, that uh, the clothes are for protection of the body. So if you are preserving the clothes, and it is, I had seen in a TV this thing, and that one dentist was telling that uh, you should change the toothbrush every three months or uh, and he said some people take pride that they are using the same brush for one year 
so my uh, only thing i wanted to tell them is the idea is to preserve the teeth and not the brush so it is the idea is uh, the clothing is not as important as the body so i want to give them therefore the rain clothes also i want to give them uh, arms here because i found that many of them go out uh, to get arms they do not always find it they spend lot of their time that they should be spending in meditation in just trying to get uh, a little food so therefore uh, this wandering about uh, uh, instead of spending time in meditations uh, they are spending in uh trying to get arms so it is my prayer that let me give them uh, arms so that they can be fed and if they fall sick uh, it is uh, not uh, conducive to their spiritual life too and uh, therefore i want to see that uh, i give them uh, medications too uh and i have the means to do that so uh will you permit me to do that and seeing uh, the understanding of this uh, pious lady uh, buddha said okay uh, i grant uh, your boons so uh, these are at many other places also uh, buddha has said that uh, just uh, uh, practicing uh, these uh, uh, austerities is not uh, really a spiritual discipline uh, so uh, he what he means by practicing these austerities is uh, really practicing truthfulness as shri ramakrishna said uh, that truthfulness is the austerity of this age a uh, practice truthfulness and there is that beautiful story uh, about it that once uh, there is we i didn't make a slide for that so need don't have to look there so it is uh, this story uh, pertains to a disciple of buddha uh, who was uh, getting married and so he requested buddha that uh, will you come to attend my wedding i would uh, i pray that please come uh, to attend my wedding and buddha said okay i will come and with uh, all his uh, hundreds of disciples uh, he went there and as it happens in these stories that although the place was uh, small uh still because of the grace of buddha it became enough for all these hundreds of uh, disciples of buddha uh, although this uh, uh, was disciple of him uh, uh, was not a man of big means whatever little food was there uh, became sufficient for everybody and then he requested buddha that uh, please uh, Uh, bless me save something give uh, your uh, message on this important day of my life i like to hear your message and buddha said that this is a wonderful day a very auspicious day uh, when two souls uh, are getting united in love a very good idea uh, that you are getting married and he said everybody must get ma- married everybody must get married and every the, this uh, they looked upon him what he wants to say these are all uh, ascetics and who have given up home and hearth they do not uh, uh, why he is telling now that everybody must get married and then he said everybody must get married to truth everybody must get married to truth and then he points out 
uh, and that is something that we have to remember uh, that look you have taken the vows of marriage but if you are not married to truth how would these vows are going to last uh, how will they remain uh, if so even for this marriage uh, between uh, this man and this woman uh, this marriage also uh, can survive only if you are first married to truth uh, then only this marriage can uh, can survive if we are not married to truth then uh, how can these other marriages survive so he said get married to truth everybody must get married to truth means practice this truthfulness that is the true austerity uh, not wearing clothes or not eating is not really truly an austerity uh, just as running after various enjoyments uh, is not austerity uh and running away from them is also not an austerity the real austerity is practicing uh, truthfulness so uh, the tales of buddha he taught like all great teachers uh, in different stories through just the common conversations uh, he took uh, the practical problems of the disciples and uh, showed the light of truth in which light in that light the problem just disappeared so that was his novel method of bringing uh, the religion the dharma uh, to the students thank you friends